Well, that's the answer to that question. <laughs> Is it not? Good morning. Good to see you today. Some of y'all look like you're happy to be here. <laughs> you happy to be here, Robbie? Oh, good deal. Well, if you've been with us any time at all, you know that we're in the book of Philippians. We're starting in part three of Philippians, which is chapter two for us. We're going to look at eight verses in Philippians today as we continue our study on extraordinary living. Uh, I, I believe that most of us, if we take a little time to be honest this morning, could, could honestly say that there's not a lot of people who understand this concept. It's all through Scripture. That if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. You know, and a lot of people will, will look at that and they agree to that. And then we look at the abundant life that Christ promises and the joy that's full of glory and the river that's everlasting, welling up from our innermost being. And, uh, but then they look at the reality of their lives and there is this, this chasm between reality and what the Bible says. Uh, how do you cross that chasm? How do we get to the other side? Well, Philippians is a, a very clear explanation of what that extraordinary life is all about and how that it really is a life that does have a difference in what the world has to offer. So as we look at it today, we're going to look at some things as we move from chapter one to chapter two, I think, that will really give you a, a greater and a more clear understanding about the extraordinary life and how do, how do I seize it? How do I capture it? And you'll see with me that a lot of people really don't get this concept or this mindset. I'm looking, there it is, over there, looking for my weather map display. <laughs> you'll notice to the right we have northern winds coming in. Right into Dallas we're starting to chill because the Texans are going to beat them. No, anyway. <laughs> That's not spiritual at all, forgive me. I, I said that for some of you, well most of you whose college teams lost yesterday. Oh, come on. The altar will be open later for you. <laughs> Everyone in the southwestern part of the United States seems to have lost yesterday. So that, I'm sure the altar will be full today. Philippians, let's look at scripture, amen? Let's get on to the important stuff about life. If therefore is, there is any con, uh, encouragement of Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete, by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit and united in one purpose. Some reason all the verses didn't make it on the screen. Do nothing. A lot of folks like that part, right? Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. These are some great passages, and today I think we're going to see that there's this leap that the apostle makes in the Holy Spirit in guiding the church about this extraordinary life and the life that, is, that really does experience and express a life of joy. That's not just about ritual, you know, or religious routine, but there really is a life that, that is to believe. And, and I really believe if you can kind of capture the substance of what's getting ready to be said here, it'll, it will transform the way that you live your life. Of course, that's what the scripture does for us. It's a constant transforming purpose, uh, process. But he starts here, he said, if there is any, and then he names these four things, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if there's any affection or any compassion, he blinds these together here. Then, if there's any of those things, then. Now, let me just say to you, all of chapter one deals with those four things. It's all a, that chapter one is that introductory statements about where he's at, what he's experiencing, where they are, who they are, what they mean to him. In fact, he, he just starts out with all that encouragement. He says, I, every time I think about you, he tells him, every time you come into my mind, I, th I praise God for you. Now, that right there should be enough for us to park and just say, you know, is that what people think about me when I come into their mind? <laughs> or is it, oh, no, what's he doing now? <laughs> That when, whenever they think about me, it's a positive. It's an exciting thing. And when they pray for me, 
They're not praying for all, over all my constant failures. I'm living a life that's consistent with the scripture. My life is committed to Christ. I'm truly a disciple of Jesus so that when they pray for me, it's a whole different arena as they pray, pray for me. It's not praying for my recovery, recovering himself from the trap that he's falling into, the, the rejoicing of the victory that, that, that my walk has become. He says, so if there's any of that, and, 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 and he talks about these things, to them, I, I thank God, I pray for you. Verse six is I'm confident about you. I'm fully confident about you. He's, he's talking about, uh, we'll see when he talks about Timothy later on in chapter two, about a track record that he has. He said, you know, Timothy's proven, you know. You don't have to worry about him being up and down and in and out. He's a proven faithful disciple. So he said, I'm he said, I have you in my heart. That's one thing to be in somebody's mind. It's another thing to be in their heart. He says, verse eight of chapter one, I long for you. In verse nine, he says, I pray that your love abounds. I pray your joy increases. So all those things he's just shared in chapter one about his love for them, his compassion, the encouragement that he's given him is all wrapped up in here when he, when he starts this part of the letter. And he says, so if there's any encouragement, if there's any consolation, if there's any fellowship of the spirit, if there's any affection and compassion, you know, if, if all that's in your life, he says, if those things are there, then here's what you do. He says, you make my joy complete. In reality, when you read the following list, you could say you can make your own joy complete as well. If you want complete joy in your heart and you want to give complete joy, and, he, and then he gives this list. And that's where this, there's nine things that are listed here. He says, if, there's, if, if, if any of that's in your life, if all that's true, there's consolation and fellowship. If all that's true, he said, then you make my joy complete by, and he, and he goes down this list with, and there's nine things here. Have the same mind. Have the same mind. And we're going to talk a lot about what that same mind is today in a moment. Ultimate boils down to the mind of Christ. Have the same love. If you want to see me rejoice, have, this, have a love that's unique. We have a little saying around our, our family sometimes. It goes something like this. And they say, I love you. The response is, I love you more. Well, it's, you know, you think about it, it's kind of like I can up you, you know, I can top you on that. I love you more. But, you know, that really, love is love. You can't really have more love if it is love, can you? It's just love. Genuine love is genuine love. He said, I want, you, I want you to keep loving one another and have the same love. And he says, be united in spirit. Now, this is his, his prayer for the church, his prayer for them individually. You'll see he's speaking to some individually as well as collectively. But the idea here is this unity of spirit and this unity of mind and this unity of love. If you want to see Jesus speaking on this, you, you can make reference later back to John 17. You can look at that in your lift group. You want to look at John 17 where he deals with that. And he talks about that high priestly prayer where Jesus is praying for this. You know, that he'll be glorified when there's this unity and lives will be changed when there's this unity. He said, be intent on, on one purpose. Well, I think that if we'll fellowship in the spirit and we're in the spirit, then out of that comes this love and this joy and this mindset and purpose. And he says, hey, by the way, do nothing from selfish ambition or, or empty conceit. You know, don't do anything out of emptiness. And emptiness comes from selfishness, which comes out of conceit. It's all about you in this world. He goes on with the list. There's, there's several more here. He says, he said, regard one another as more important than yourself. That's a strong statement, isn't it? If there's any consolation, be humble in your mind. Regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not look out on your personal interest only, but other people's interest. And have the same, one scripture, one translation says mind, another says attitude that is in Jesus Christ which is ultimately this, this attitude of, of others. Now, each item regards, you know, whether it's mind or spirit or purpose, it all, it all comes back to what he's talking about here with the last point here, you know, of having, having the mind which is in Christ Jesus. Having the same mind which is in Christ Jesus. What mind is that? The Bible tells us, the apostle writes in an earlier passage, that God has given us this mind, that we have the mind of Christ. And I love this, the, the, con, the context of this because he's just shown you what that mind of Jesus is. I mean, he just listed eight things which reveal the mind of Christ. Now, here's, here's the beautiful thing about when we get saved. There is a radical transformation that goes on. Now, we can, we can pay attention to it or we can not, all right? But radically, something is different than the way it used to be. You can choose, you can, you can fail and, and, and say, I'm just going to live by what I, I want. And it's my outlook, and it's my perception, and it's my idea, and it's the way I look at it, and the way I see it, it's my outlook on life. You, you can go back to that. But when you give your life to Jesus, something else has happened. 
And there's this radical thing that went on where now God put something in you that is unique and it's called the life of Jesus. And in the context of that is the mind of Christ. You, you have the ability to know God's thoughts. You have the ability for God to communicate with you now. You have the ability to hear from God. You have the ability to see things and perceive things differently, to discern. You didn't have that before. It's what are you going to do with that? But you have that right now. You have the mind of Christ. Now, what happens uh, when Jesus said, except you repent, you know, you'll perish. Over and over in Scripture, there's this word repent, repent, repent. Well, you know what repent is? It is a Greek word which many times can be translated instead of the word repent to change your mind. Change your mind. You've been living your life with your mind. How you perceive it, how you think it, how, how you ought to go, what you want to do, what you want out of life, where you want to go. That's how you've lived your life. But now you've given your life to Christ. There's a change of mind. And that change of mind, that repentance that, that the scripture talks about is a supernatural thing that God works in you so that now you have the capacity to go another way. You have the capacity to do what's right. You have the capacity to be free from your sin. You have the ability now to move in a different direction. And what really changes is you have this new outlook. You, know, you, you see differently. When you get your eyes open, you'll see differently. Now, you can get dim in your vision and you can start looking back to the world and all those, you know, the, the things of the earth go strangely dim. That song really fits that right. As long as you're looking at the things of the world, they go strangely bright. But when you start looking to Jesus, the things of the world go, start going strangely dim. And the more that you focus on him and embrace him, the more that your perception, the more that your approach to life, the more of your outlook on life changes. And by the way, even secular people will tell you this, outlook determines outcome. And especially so in scripture. If my outlook is on things above, if my outlook is the will of God for my life, if my outlook is to really glorify God with my mind, my body, my soul, and my spirit, the outcome changes. The outcome changes. And so you see this in scripture where he talks about, you know, to have the mind of Christ and, to, you know, we're, we're, now that you're not... You're not living after your thought life. You're now pursuing a different context and a, and a different life that, that, that's demonstrated here by these things that are in this list of nine things, so to say. God's doing something that's so real in you that it's a different approach to living. This is not the way the world approaches life. This is not the way the world approaches life. We don't look out for the interest of others. We look out for the interest of self. Number one, our life focuses around. Boy, that, that, that outlook, that that. You know, that we call it stinking thinking, you know, that stinking thinking gets into our church, into our spiritual life, and it will wreck ruin. Yes. It'll destroy a church. It'll destroy fellowship with other believers. It'll destroy your own family, it'll destroy your life when you don't embrace the, the mind of Christ. Well, what is that mind? Well, Paul tells us, you know, in, in this letter, you know, it, the one thing that's clear is, is this anthem of joy. But what's it based upon? Go back to chapter one. The secret of joy in spite of circumstances having a single mind. You know, he says, hey, the gospel's being preached. The word's going out. Remember we talked about, it. he says, I'm chained to prisoners day and night. Guess what's happening? They're, I mean, I'm chained to guards as a prisoner. They're getting saved. And now, because they're getting saved, the word of God is going out all of Caesar's palace and all through the Roman Praetorian Guard, all right? Not only are the elite soldiers getting saved, but also the people in Caesar's palace are getting saved. And he's rejoicing. Most people be sitting there grumbling, complaining, why this hurts? Can you make this a little looser? Can I have some different food to eat? And on and on it go. <laughs> it's not him. He's got this single mind. Well, for, and what is it? It gets back to that. Me live as Christ, die as gain. Live as Christ, die as gain. Live as Christ. I'm here. I, for me live as where I, where I is, Jesus is. Amen. Where I am, Jesus am. Put their mind together. They'll go together right sooner or later. <laughs> so there's this. But when he moves to chapter 2, now you start saying, that's the first element of that extraordinary life. It's the Christ life. But now he moves into under, giving an understanding and giving clarity. So it's that when he looks at chapter one, it's that single mind. But chapter two, he starts showing the, the secret and joy of spite of people is a submissive mind. First of all, it's joy in spite of all the circumstances he's going through. Now, boy, don't you know it? We have to live with people. Like one preacher said, you know, I love the ministry. It's people I can't stand. <laughs> it was a Peanuts cartoon, you know. It says, you know, uh, I, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. I think that's one on he had. We live with people. 
We deal with people. Every day, it's, you're here with people today. You go to work, it's people. You go to school, there's people. Everywhere you go. And people can irritate you, right? People can drive you crazy. People can make you happy. People can make you smile. People can make you laugh. People can make you cry. People can break your heart. I mean, there's people everywhere you go. And so he starts saying, you want, you want to maintain this joy in circumstances? And you keep your mind on, on Christ and things that are above, not things below. And if you want around in relationships, remember what we've been called to. It, it, it's, it, and it means now that whereas I had this uh, single mind, now I have this submissive mind. And this is where it's hard for a lot of people to grasp the word of God. And it, it's hard to grasp the word of God when it deals with these issues about our relationship with other people and how humility and servanthood and submissiveness all come into that. Because, again, we are so self-centered. Our life is all about me. You know, it's all about me. They're just people, you know, you, you talk to people all the time. Don't you love to talk to somebody and they say, hey, tell me all about yourself. And then they never pause because they're too busy telling you about themselves. I dated a girl like that one time. She was so caring for about 30 seconds. <laughs> Maybe a minute. And there was just the whole world, her world, you know. There's people all around us like that. And we, we must take caution that we are not that person. That we really do have concern. That we really do care about people. That the world doesn't revolve around us, but it really does revolve around Jesus. Now, the key verse to all this is found in two, chapter 2, verse 3, when he says, uh, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better and more important than themselves. That kind of rolls off the tongue, sounds religious and sweet and great, but that's a reality of if you really want to have the mind of Christ and have this submissive mind, then it has to be, it has to be this. Let nothing be done. Now, nothing is a real unique Greek word that actually means nothing. <laughs> Do nothing, but it doesn't stop there because some people are good at that part. Do nothing from self-centeredness, self-conceit, ambition, ego. But again, that's, that's not the way things start. That's why marriage is always a surprise for a lot of people. <laughs> because when we meet, it's all about, you know, you may think it's all about them, but it's really all about you. Oh, she makes me feel so good, man. She likes what I like. We like the same stuff. We, we both drink Dr. Pepper. Yeah. We like that kind of movie. We, 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 we both like whatever. And it's all about you and what they do for you. Right? And we shared this at our marriage conference that nothing exposes self-centeredness more than marriage. Yeah. Amen? Amen. It just shows you how selfish and how whiny you can be and how self-centered your world is and how you want everybody serving you and you married her and you, you, you thought she would do that for you and this for you and that for you. And, you know, or you thought he would be this and he would be that. Had all these enormous expectations and all those expectations are based on what I want. It's what I want. It's where you need to be. This is what I thought you were. You know? And marriage has a way of really bringing us back to reality. Amen. It's always fun to, to leave church on Sunday morning. Every once in a while, I preach a really good sermon. And I know it. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. <laughs> and then Kathy says something like this. Uh, I'm waiting to get in the car and, you know, hear something about how wonderful it was. And she says something. Take a, take a look at the odometer. Isn't it about time for an oil change? <laughs> Excuse me. Mr. Wonderful sitting right here. <laughs> Don't you realize who's present in the car? We're talking oil changes. When you just heard the greatest sermon ever preached to humanity. Outside, you know, the Mount of Beatitudes sermon. You got my drift, okay. He said, don't, leave, don't do anything from that. I mean, don't preach from that. Don't, don't do your marriage from empty conceit or something, what you can get out of the marriage. Just, that's not the way you live your life. In fact, you go back to Philippians chapter 1, it all deals with Christ first. It's Christ first. In Philippians chapter, boy, these things are all weird today. In Philippians chapter 2, it is others next. Christ first, others next. In Philippians chapter 1, 
It's Paul the soul winner who's caring about people. I'm a soul winner. He's the proof. In Philippians chapter 2, it's Paul the servant. But yet, that's, again, it doesn't equate with us so much. I think the greatest word we need to understand when we start dealing with it, the mind of Christ is this, this uh, getting a biblical grip on what humility is and what it means. I shared this quote in my e-blast this, this, this week where he talked about, uh, about humility and what it means. Uh, I don't remember where I got this. The humble person is not the one who thinks meanly of himself. He simply does not think of himself at all. I, I grew up most of my life hearing that the secret of joy is Jesus, others, and you, right? J for Jesus, O for others, Y for you. But if you follow the context of Philippians chapter 2, the secret of joy is just Jesus and others. It's short for Joe, by the way. No, that's all. <laughs> Jesus and others. But what about me? Don't worry about you. That's what he's saying here. Don't worry, it's not about you. So you don't have to worry about you. Don't bring you into the equation. It's Jesus. And it's others. But what, 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 and it doesn't mean that, 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 that you're some kind of... Uh, you know, a doormat for everybody, kind of at the beck and call of everybody. That, that's not what he's saying, and he's not even suggesting that. He's suggesting what, what he wrote to the Corinthians in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, when he said, Ourselves, ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Here to serve you for the sake of Christ. I'm here to honor the Lord by serving you for the sake of Christ. I think someone also put it well, he said, Humility is that one grace at the moment you discover that you have it, you lose it. And you start getting proud of humility. Others is the key idea of, of this chapter, and, and especially in 3 and 4, when he says, you know, don't do anything through vain strife or glory. You know, you turn your eyes away from yourself. You turn your eyes to the, to the, to the needs of others, and you, you adopt and you embrace what he's talking about, this submissive mind, this submissive mind. And again, we could, we could interchange some words here when he talks about submissive mind, the, the mind of Christ really to the attitude of Christ. What was, the, what was the, the attitude that he embraced? It goes back to our salvation. We see everything that he's done for us. Uh, obviously, in, in Christ, there, there's nothing but this, this absolute picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and his humility for us. How he humbled himself. And so he's writing here, you know, he says, you know, if, if you really want to... An outlook that determines a joyous outcome, then make sure that the outlook is the same outlook that Jesus had. It's the same mindset. It's the same approach. It's the same attitude that Jesus had. Because in doing that, this submissive mind to Jesus' mind, I'll embrace the mind of Christ, that it is about him and it is about others. What will God do? He'll do something supernatural in your life. He'll do, and this extraordinary life will be a reality. And then what he does, if you follow the flow of the scripture here, in Philippians, as he says, embrace the mind of Christ in verse 5, he gets into the following verses in 5, 6, and 7, and he starts talking about this Christ, the, the Lord Jesus. And he gives us a very clear demonstration of what this other mindedness, this submissive mindedness is not. And he takes us back to look at Jesus in eternity past. He says, Jesus, Jesus, look, look, look to the Lord, and revival refers to him as it says about him, even though he was in the form of God, He didn't think it is something to be grasped. And let me explain that in just a moment. But let's look at the form of God first. It really has nothing to do with a shape or a size, all right? God is spirit, remember. He, 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 he's not thought to be thought of. It's hard to think of God in human terms because he's bigger than human terms. It's hard to even describe it. God. So the scripture just says God is spirit. And the Bible does talk about the eyes of the Lord. It talks about the hand of the Lord, all right? talks about the wings in another place. It doesn't mean that God flies around with hands and eyes and all that. It, 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 those are, those are uh, Scripture's way and God's way of teaching us those, those divine attributes of what God is like, to express the, His characteristics to us. But when it talks about form, it means that everything that God is and was in eternity past, so is Jesus, one with God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, absolutely equal. Jesus Christ, basically saying here, Jesus Christ is God, even though Jesus is God. I mean, he's God. He humbled himself. He took upon this outlook. He took upon this attitude of servanthood. He's God. By the way, if he's God, he doesn't need anything, right? 
I mean, he doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anything from me. He doesn't need anything from you. People act like they're doing something for God all the time. But God doesn't need it. We just get to honor God and to, to love him. But he, you know, Jesus is, is equal, Paul is saying, with God. And you find that in John 1, when the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, speaking of Jesus. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. So he's in the beginning with the Father. Hebrews talks about him being the expressed image of God. Colossians talks about him being filled with the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So understand, Jesus is God. But as God, what did he do? He humbled himself, took on the form of servant. He didn't think of himself. He had all the privileges that God, being God, affords. But he didn't take that. He didn't grasp of that. He didn't consider it. In fact, when, in, in verse 6, when it's talking about that, it, 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 it says, He does not consider his equality with God as something selfishly to be held on to. It's another way you could state that. In other words, he didn't think of himself, I'm God, that's it. He thought of others. I remember reading a, a story that a reporter was interviewing this guy who was real good at placing people in, in jobs in leadership roles and businesses and things like that. And he'd placed hundreds of workers and, you know, in, in vocations that they were quite thrilled with and were very productive in those positions. This reporter, when I read the article, he was asking him, he said, well, what is the secret when you, when you place people in these different jobs of people looking for qualified people and people will be ultimately good leaders in their, in their positions that they're being hired for? He said, you know, what, what's the secret to all that? Here, here was the quote. He said, if you want to find out what a worker is really like, don't give him responsibilities, give him privileges. Most people can handle responsibilities if you pay them enough, he went on to say. But it takes a real leader to handle privileges. A leader will use his privileges to help others, to build others, to build the organization. A lesser man will use privileges just to promote himself. Well, that's a Christian lesson. That's a biblical lesson. That's a lesson from the life of Christ who had every privilege that could be afforded as God. And what does he do? He comes to build us. He comes to change us. He came to elevate us. He came to make us new creations. He came to fit us for eternity. Amen? You want to look for something and how people handle the privilege and the power they have when it becomes abused for just for their sakes, then they're not really leaders. Jesus demonstrates what true leadership is about. He takes these heavenly privileges and he invests them for us, for our sake, to change our lives. And again, let me go back to this. Thinking of others, you know, uh, is it, foreign to most people in churches today even. In fact, if we do think of others many times, it's some, some kind of abstract sense, you know, it's, it's really insufficient. Because we never really get down to the nitty gritty of really serving people. He said, well, I'll serve them, you know, if they show up. But if not enough of them show up, I don't think I'm going to serve them. <laughs> I'll serve them if I get something out of the deal, if they appreciate me. And if they genuinely appreciate me, then I'll continue to serve them. Well, you've got the idea what I'm talking about. Boy, this, again, let's get back to the reality of, of marriage. This is certainly true in marriage, is it not? <laughs> This other mindedness, this loving your wife as Christ loved the church. Well, this gets down to not just loving your wife as Christ loved the church. This is loving the church body and loving the people of the body and loving the world as Christ loved them. Jesus thought of others. What happened to Israel? He becomes a servant. What happens when I think of others? I'll tell you, sometimes when I think of others, I think, oh, what a mess. Oh, Lord, I have to do that. Oh, Lord, that's going to take a lot of my time. Oh, that's going to take some It's going to take some money. If I think of others. Not so with Christ. In fact, Paul traces these the steps of, of humility and he goes through and, and just look at the way he, he lays it out in Scripture. First of all, it says he emptied himself laying aside the, and this, basically this way I put it, laying aside the independent use of his own attributes. All right? It's not that he didn't have them. He still has all the attributes of God. He just doesn't use them. He lives as a man. He becomes a man. And the only time that he uses them is in reliance upon his father to express that authority through him. He doesn't do it on his own head. And that's what, that's what it meant in, in John when he says, all these miracles, the th works that I do, I do not do them. I can do nothing on my own. I only do what the father tells me to do. All right? 
He said, I'm acting in, in accordance with God's will for my life. And he modeled that for them. He could have acted independently, but he's God, all right? But he didn't. So our lives now, we see even greater how important that is that we act accordingly and in union and in step with God's will and God's word and what God wants to do through our lives. And so many people never get to experience the joy of literally having God work through them, minister through them, reach out through them, touch people's life through them because they don't live with this submissive mind, the mind of Christ. So what can I get? What can I do? What can I get away with? What can I get out of this? Do I have to do that? Do I have to go all the way? Do I have to give everything? No, you just continue to be miserable. Continue to read the Bible and say, that's a great promise. I wonder why it's not in my life. That's some good stuff about peace and joy and grace and blessing. Why, why, am, why am I not experiencing that? Because we want, we want surrender to the mind of Christ. And realize it's not about us. Jesus just dumps it all out and says, it's all, here, it's all on the altar. It's all on the altar. And this is where Paul is when he, when he says, to live is Christ. And what if you die? That's even better. <laughs> it's gay. Second step, this is he, just, he, he permanently becomes a human, all right? He takes upon the form of a man. Lives in that form today. A glorified man now. But he's, he's a man. And he takes upon this for all eternity. And he comes and takes on this sinless physical body and he commits no sin. And takes upon himself what? Well, the Bible says he used that body to become a servant. I didn't come to be served, but to serve. Let me ask you this morning, why'd you come? I just came, well, I need a blessing. Well, why don't you come in here and be a blessing? Amen. I need to get something. Why don't you come give something? And you might get something. It's the mind of Christ. The fourth thing Paul says, he took that body, he went to the cross, willingly died, willingly gave up himself right then and there. So what's the secret of joy? Jesus, others, and you know it's Jesus and others. Just make it that. That's, that's servanthood. Man, thank God that Jesus did this because there would be no hope for us. But I mean, that, that translates, folks, to where you're at in your life. What is God waiting to do through you while you're piddling your thumbs, spiritually speaking, if that's where you are? Amen? And don't even look back what God did yesterday. Hey, I want to be used by God today. What's God going to do today with my life? Uh, too many people, you know, and I used to tell this to youth groups all the time when I preached in youth groups, that, you know, it's, it's like they're digging around the garbage can looking for stale bread and moldy meat. Because they live with a different mind. It's like, oh, I love Jesus, but what can I, what, can, what does the world still have to offer? Oh, that looks pretty good over there. Yeah, I'll try that. Well, yeah, get the roaches off of it. Get bugs away from it. Yeah. And everybody's doing it, so it's no big deal, right? I mean, no, you, you live your life like that, then you're going to live this subpar, spiritually in the basement kind of Christian life. And by the way, this is not something you learn today and it's done. This is something you have to go through school on every day. Every day. That's why Paul said, I die daily. It's every day. And we get to that point, guess what? Then I think we go back to what Paul was saying. He said, so if there is encouragement in Christ, if there is consolation, if there is fellowship with the Spirit, if there's affection and compassion, if all that, if that's a, what you're ready to embrace in your life, well, it gets down to this. Be single-minded, be submissive-minded. Be single-minded, live as Christ. I want my life to be an expression of Jesus when I go out tomorrow on the job. I want my life to be an expression of Jesus when I'm at school. I want my life to be an expression of Jesus this afternoon in my home. I want my life to be an expression of Jesus whenever, wherever. And then move just out of that what God's giving me, you know, in, the, in regard to that new single mind. But realize the attitude of that single mind is no longer from empty conceit. And by the way, there's nothing emptier than selfishness. It never produces anything. Out of empty conceit. So, 
let me, let me just put it this way. This morning I got dressed a little bit earlier than normal, so I'm sitting there. And I said, well, let me just see what the religious are doing. I'm going to turn my TV on. It's nice checking with the religious every once in a while. I watched about three minutes of about five different shows, and every one of them, without fail, was what you can get from God. What you can get from God. What God can give you. What God can get you. You can be healed. You can have this. You can be richer. You can have this. You can, you know, and on and on it went. I think that's not the gospel. It's not about you. Ultimately, you receive the blessing. Praise God. You get the exaltation. You, you get the glory of God resting in your life. But it's really about Christ. And it's about the Lord God of glory. It's about Him. You know, and when we get back to making my spiritual life, my religion, my, re my relationship, my spiritual, about God, my love, my commitment, my surrender to Him, guess what happens? Then He begins to work in me. And He says, hey, I, I'll use that person because they have, they have a single mind. But the using part of you now means that you also embrace that mind of Christ as your single mind and let God start using you in somebody's life. You know? How, how often do we go to church, though, with that attitude? How often do we go out in the world with that attitude? It's usually, what are you going to do for me? What are you going to do for me? We're gonna, I talked with a guy this week who was considering our church and bringing his family to our church, and we talked a little bit. And I said, hey, but if you're really looking for a good, strong, lots and lots of kids youth ministry, you know, we don't have any Xboxes. <laughs> don't have any mini bowling alleys. Don't, don't have all that. I said, but I do know a church that's got all that. And I, you know, if you'd like to go over there, if that's what it's about, about, having your kids get in a popular group of kids and having all the toys, then I can tell you where to go. But if you want somewhere, we're going to come in and we're going to disciple them and preach them the word and teach them the word and call them on the carpet and, you know, tell them it's all about Jesus and preparing for street ministries and outreach, you know, to, and missions and, and, you know, this is a good place. Children's ministry, it's the same. Not, we don't have the prettiest playground. Do we have a playground? We got toys. Okay, give me that break. All right. <laughs> but we want kids hearing about Jesus, knowing about Jesus, understanding about Jesus, Jesus music, Jesus songs, Jesus lessons. Amen? Amen. The mind of Christ. Reaching people with Jesus, but moving from that place where we know Christ, have Christ, love Christ, and now saying, God, you have me. It's about others now. How do you want to use me? Amen? Amen. Let's stand with our heads bowed.